Hey everyone, Eric Coffey here, bringing you another episode of Making a Giant. Today's episode, Making a Giant, we interview Nicole Sharp. Nicole actually works at three of the largest defense contractors out there, Booz Allen Hamilton, Accenture, and Kelly Services. But we're not talking about that today. In today's upcoming episode, she sits down with our very own Marie Martinez, where they discuss how did she win her very first contract? So for all of you who are new to Making a Giant, it's the podcast where we interview everyday students like yourselves who actually just started their businesses and they're just starting embarking on their federal journey. And so today we are talking with Nicole Sharp from Griffin Consulting Partners. She started her business back five years ago, but it wasn't really until uh, just two years. That's right. She quit her job and dug deep into the organization. She spent six months away from friends and everybody just learning about the business. And then when she finally won her first contract, she still questioned whether or not she should be here. Does that sound like a lot of people out there? I bet it does. So again, stay tuned for this upcoming episode of Making a Giant with Maria Martinez and Nicole Sharp. Today in Making a Giant, I want to welcome a very special student of ours, and she took me by surprise. So as you guys hear this story today for the first time, it'll be my first time hearing it. So like you guys know, I love the storytelling, and I love the new stories and the new excitement that there is, and learning about people's journeys, just because all of our journeys are so different. But at the end, our goals are the same. So today, I want to welcome Nicole Sharp. She's actually CEO of Griffin Consulting Partners. And Nicole, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. So Nicole, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where did you grow up? Where are you located and your business? Yeah, so I'm a military brat. So I think it's safe to say when you're a military brat, you're from all over. But um, I was born in, I was born and partially raised. I would say I was born and partially raised in the Hampton Roads area, which is like Norfolk, which is a, norm, mm -hmm. a, a military area. Sorry. Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia. Yes. So in my mind, I'm always like Norfolk is that's the only place is Norfolk, Virginia. And I also spent a lot of time in, uh, in Florida, throughout all of Florida. And uh, so my partial home is different places in uh, Florida. We were based there in Pensacola, Jacksonville, and Fort Lauderdale. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So I planted my roots there. And uh, my mother decided that we were going to go back to the Hampton Roads area and uh, lived in Chesapeake, Virginia. And so that's kind of the area that I claim. However, I now live in the Washington DC area and, uh, and you know, lived a couple of other places prior to, to that. So DC has been my home for a few years. Oh, awesome. Yeah, last time I was in DC was at the start of COVID last year. Oh yeah? Yeah, that, I, I remember that because I remember flying back at the airport and people were like starting to hear it and we had a conference and a lot of people started canceling like the agencies, so. Yeah. That's the last thing I, th I think of DC was that conference. Yeah, so. yeah. DC, I mean, we're still kind of like on lockdown. Um, and I will say, I, you know, I, we still have like our family home down in uh, the Florida area. So what's funny is that's kind of our go-to, but lockdown is still real here. So masks are fully implemented. And, you know, I think some of the restaurants uh, have been gone to one, but I think it's still like 30% capacity. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm from Florida. We we closed down for maybe a half a second. <laughs> I know. I went down there um, during the holiday. Actually, in November, I was mm -hmm. down there. And I'm like, is there COVID? <laughs> is COVID existing down here? <laughs> we went to the beach, and it's like a normal Sunday at the beach. So yeah, so we are a little bit different than other states. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I love this state. Like I said, growing up there, it's like I'm home away from home. But coming to DC, I'm like, oh, rules. <laughs> <laughs> it is DC. They should have rules. Yes, yes, it's important. All right. So tell us a little bit about your business. So, yes, I, um, I work with, I'm actually the CEO of Griffin Consulting Partners LLC. And I have to be honest, um, although we've had the, I've had the business for um, about five years, I still say we, and I say I work for because I'm so used to being in that environment. And also I'm a little humble. So when people ask, what do I do? I just say, oh, I'm, I, you know, I just, I just work. I, I'm very, you know, kind of used to saying that and not mm -hmm. necessarily talking about it. So 
with uh, being transparent. I always say that, but GCP has been in existence for the last five years and we provide solutions in the Fed health space. And we also work with companies that are looking to grow and get into the Fed health space. So we work with um, opportunities with the VA, military health services all throughout DOD and all of the military treatment facilities, and also state and local um, federal hospitals. So like COVID hospitals that are coming, you know, that are popping up and things of that nature. We work with them and also medical supplies. Oh, wow. That's very interesting. How did you end up having your business? How did you have this idea of this is what I want to do next? So, so I actually, I'll take a step back a few years ago before moving to DC, I came to DC one, because I, my mother said, you have VA money and you need to go to college. <laughs> so it was to come back here and I was working in the film and entertainment industry and I loved it living in New York, which was a great opportunity. And um, ironically, my first opportunity, I worked for Music Cares, which is the healthcare side. Uh-huh. And my minor was in healthcare as well. So um, I knew that I was going to be a producer. I was going to work there. And just to really be honest with you guys, every Thursday, I would watch Different World and also the Cosby show. And I was so excited about the people that were on the show, but also <laughs> behind the scenes. Because oh. I thought that was so cool on the production. And so I had a cousin that was in the entertainment business. And I thought that's what I was going to do. However, growing up, I knew that I loved business. And when I worked in film and television, I worked as a um, producer assistant, but I didn't always work on the, on the scene or like on shows. I actually worked in the contracting area. And so I never, I know who would have thunk it. And so even when, you know, I, I wound up um, getting another opportunity to actually work as a staffing um, consultant, I still didn't handle (laughs) contracts. And I kept saying, what in the world? So when I moved to the Washington, D.C. area, I worked for um, a project that was on the Hill, and it was related to film and television, still dealing with contracts. And someone said, you should get into um, consulting. And I said, what does that look like? I mean, I, you know, my background, my major was in um it was broadcast journalism, but I've always worked in staffing or recruiting and um, also working in other areas on the healthcare side. Um, I didn't mention as a child, I was actually like a candy striper. So oh. <laughs> you know what that is? Yes, like the- I remember from like the '90s shows, like <laughs> the candy striper. Candy striper. So what that? So for people who don't know what that is, because all the time people are like, "What is a candy striper?" <laughs> It's the kids that would volunteer in the summertime at the hospital. And my aunts and uncles, they were always in healthcare. My aunt was a registered nurse. Okay. That's how you, the healthcare. That's how healthcare was always stemmed. And then also the bad side, which I used to say, oh my God, I was a military brat and we would go to the hospital and I literally would go to Portsmouth Naval all the time. And I would tell my mom, I'm tired of living here at this hospital. I'll never come back here when I get older. (laughs) And now that's not the case because <laughs> I support the, not that hospital, but I support the hospitals. And so I was like, man, you know, just learning about healthcare and appreciating it and mm-hmm. understanding. So uh, needless to say, when I moved to the Washington DC area, I worked for a large government consulting firm and um, started out there and working on in various agencies. And I just really loved it. And I had a mentor who was a senior VP. I would only talk to them about like, how does this work? Like, for, can you first tell me what a consultant is? I'm sorry, I, I was in my twenties still, I was still young. And I said, I'm going to graduate school. I'm not quite sure what I want to do. I, you know, but I know I, HR, that's what I've been doing. Even when I volunteered at hospitals, um, you know, working in various offices. And I, I really like that. My family wants me to be a nurse, but I'm not sure if I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was honest with myself. I did a lot of self-searching on what I wanted to do um, at that time. And, and so I worked on the contract and then that contract, it did not end. I actually went to um, an event and met someone and, and wound up working and interviewing for another uh, large consulting firm, um, at, which was, uh, is it okay to say the name of the consulting firms? Yeah, if you're okay with it, yes. Oh, okay with, yeah, so I worked at Accenture 
uh, back in the day. And, and at that time, I, you know, was transitioning from the staffing firm I was working with, which was uh, at Kelly Services. So started at Kelly Services when I first moved here to DC. And that's how I got into understanding just kind of like, oh, this is what, you know, a, a role is or a position and mm-hmm. what that looks like. And that was really, really a great opportunity. Um, and then when I worked at Accenture, I still was like, okay, I'm still doing recruitment HR, but I, for the agency, but I didn't understand how it works, you know, how government contracting work. I just knew I had a job and I liked my job. Okay. Um, yeah. And so just being myself networking, I met with other people and then I interviewed at Booz Allen and I went there and that's really where I got this bug. And I felt, I don't know if other people that worked at Booz Allen, the Booz Allen before they went public, the idea was you kind of sell yourself. And I always felt like Booz Allen was, it puts you in that position to start a business if you ever wanted to consider. Because Mm -hmm. in my mind, I, I applied for the job, I worked on the project, but what was different was I would have to go out and meet other people and sell myself about working on projects. And learning that, and then you also, at that time, you work on um, other, you learn about, you know, extra time and working on contracts and building those and maybe working on red teams, tiger teams, and, you know, those type of things. And I never, I I still was like, I'm just on a team. I'm just happy to be here type of attitude. Um, But I really loved my customers. And and when I say I really love my customers, I studied my customers in the sense of like, how does this work? Why is the government doing these things? Tell me what that means. Like, I know this might be a a dumb question, but what does a bed mean to you? Like, (laughs) I know, I know what a bed is, but can you explain, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in DOD, how do you guys identify, you know, a, a hospital bed, you know, that those type of questions. And I think that also, had them kind of go back and say, hmm, okay, this is interesting. Um, And I say that because I had one project that I worked on. Um, I was supposed to be there for six weeks and I stayed for about five years. And (laughs) And that's working with Booz Hamilton? And that was working at Booz Allen and Hamilton, yes. And uh, through that time, I, uh, you know, applied and worked. uh, I left there and worked for a Native American-owned company. Oh, wow. and, and, and I stayed at each company for a few years. Um, I know I look young. Th- thank you, Lord. Yes. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> but, but no, I, I'm, I'm proud to say I just turned 40. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wow, I can't believe I've, you know, been in the industry for a very long time. And, and I'm one of those people, I, if I don't know, I honestly don't know. And I'll go research and I'll ask. And, and that's think, a good thing to do. Like some yeah. people are scared. Some people are timid. Some people just assume, but you just ask, like you said, what is a bid? What does it mean to you? What is a bad? Like, what does that mean? Like, the, and those are questions that are very important because you were put in these positions and you just went from one to the other, but at the same time, you're grasping every single person's like point of view, every single person's strength, every single contract and things like that. So yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I'm a sponge naturally, but I, I really made the decision to become a sponge when I got here to DC. Um, I knew people, but I didn't have relationships. I, 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 you know, I grow, come from a home that had a lot of like relationships and, and I'll say, if I did, I didn't know it. You know, we didn't talk about those things. My mom said, when you graduate from school, get a good government job. And I used to tell her, no, I won't do that. I'm going to go work (laughs) in film and television and I'm going to have a grand life. And if I don't, I don't know, but I won't be working for the government. And, (laughs) and ironically, I worked for the government. I guess the moral of the story, especially since it's close to mother's day, listen to your mom. (laughs) Yes. Oh, they, they, they know it. It's like the, I think once they become, you become a mom or they became a mom, like they have this sixth sense about your child. Yes. Because when she tells me don't do something or, or something like that, I'm like, okay, I've, I've done things around her. So many. like the first day I got my car, she's like, don't go anywhere. And I was like, okay. I was in high school. I went and I actually dented my car. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So it's like, I take whatever she says and I'm like, no, 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 no. Like if she has that feeling, I'm good. Yes, I, I definitely learned that. I mean, I have so many stories. I'm, I'm, I, I talk about like manifestation in my personal life and just praying and things. And I'm not mm-hmm. super religious, but uh, 
I'll just say this one story. My godmother, who I call my aunt, when I moved from New York, before I moved from New York to, uh, to the DC area, I went to church with her and she actually said, God, God gave me a message and said, you're going to move to DC. And I literally said, God didn't text me. <laughs> angry so I say all that to say you know they they know you know and and so um I I used to talk to them a lot and you know try to say okay is this the right way to go and making sure that I'm doing the right thing or I'm aligned with where I'm supposed to be Mm -hmm. and you asked the question about starting my business you know other people saw it in me and I had friends and, and uh, I would say people that I call family, they're not necessarily family members, mm-hmm. but very close um, to, to me as family. Um, they saw me working hard and said, Hey, have you ever thought about starting your own business? And I said, no, I mean, yes, I, yeah, but not in this arena. And going back to that, I went to church and again, not to be super religious. No, I literally, cause I went to church to ask, cause I asked God for a sign. I'm honestly, like, <laughs> and I was like, I need a sign. Like, you know, I wound up going, you know, on a trip and, um, and saying, I, I think it's time for me to change. I feel like something's saying I need to go into a different direction and I'm at every turn trying not to do it. And, uh, I look at signs when people who I know don't know each other and they say the same thing, obviously that's something, right? Okay. You know? And so that that's kind of what happened for me where, you know, not a person that worked in the government, they literally, a friend of mine said, have you ever thought about starting your own business? And I said, I don't know what my business would be. And then the preacher said, you should think about starting your own business if you have a sign. That was the topic. And I'm like, what's going on here? Like, how did we get <laughs> You know, and, and I just start researching. I, I, I actually Googled, found GovCon Giants. And I said, I said to myself, you know, if I do these things mm-hmm. uh, as it relates to things that I personally wanted, you know, small things, like I pay them off my car, you know, I, I pay off this bill, then I know that's a sign. Well, lo and behold, that was <laughs> during the time and that was the sign. So it was like, okay, these are three things. Okay, that's my go. Probably not the smartest thing to do, but everything was aligned. And, and I also felt comfortable and I felt at peace that I was in the right direction of starting my own business. And I said, you know what? I don't know what I don't know, but I'm going to find the answers and I'm going to believe and step on on faith. And so oh, wow. I actually quit my job the day my niece was born. And that's kind of how this story started. And I, and I did not, I have not looked back. Um, you know, I still have great relationships with all of the companies that I've worked for. And I'm gracious that, you know, I've had those opportunities, but it, things are just aligning themselves for it to be right. And there are days I'm like, oh, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And that's awesome at the same time. Yeah. It's been yeah. a crazy ride because my story has been so unique. And when I say unique, because I've kind of said, you know what? I'm, I'm not coming in with relationships or things of that nature. I'm just going to look at what I can read. As you can tell, I, l- I read a lot of books. Um, and these are books I've accumulated and read as, as I started the journey of my business. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, although I didn't spend as much time with my friends, I spent a lot of time learning my craft and learning that I wanted to make this a decision to really have a business. So, you know, becoming, you know, learning Lean Six Sigma and understanding what that means and and literally taking notes and saying, okay, if this means that, that means this, how do I go back and and perfect what I thought I knew and fix what I can't um, and going through the process. So that's awesome. When you, okay. When you started your business, did you know you only wanted to do government contracts at that point? So I knew I really wanted to do government contracting because I felt at that time, that's all I knew coming from the consulting world. You know, I knew that it was really great at understanding and reading contracts, whether they were government contracts or just general contracts Mm -hmm. because of my experience in the past. I actually thought at one point I wanted to go to law school. And so I took a summer program for law school and got scared out of my wits and said, I don't know if I'm mentally strong for law school, but I know I have a knack and I have friends who could like, and when I say friends, they're either practice law 
or they actually could tell me and answer questions that I couldn't have answers to. Um, and so I did well in the program, but I made a conscious decision. I'm not going to go to law school, but I do want to figure this part out. And maybe at another time, I'll go to law school later. So I made that conscious decision that I was going to do this because I kept saying, I'm, I'm betting on everybody else. Why not bet on myself? That's what I kept telling myself. Mm. Nothing beats a failure, but a try. I've done all of these other things to please other people. And somebody or something is saying I should do this. And it's screaming at me. What it, all I can do is try. And if it doesn't work out, I can always find a job. Yeah. And you've take, took all the things that you learned and applied it to where you want to be now. Because if you, like you said, you did all these things, but you also made a lot of people successful in your reading of the contracts and whatever tasks you had. So now you just have to do the same things, but it's going to be for yourself. What do you think are the biggest things that you took away from being a consultant for these bigger companies? So I loved the bigger companies because I learned systems. You know, each company that I worked for, I felt like I was like in training, if that means it makes sense. Even though I worked there, I felt like an intern. And I had to say, let me think how the organization thinks. And let me understand what the mission is and what they want from the customer. And so each company had different things. In my mind, Accenture was very systems oriented and everything is allocated. And I love that because it allowed me to understand why I some contracts are the way they are. And so when it when it came time to understand the different types of contracts, I was like, I know this, I remember this, I can put this together. And then other times when it came to relationship building, I, I think I learned that from just me being myself. I, I will say, you know, you take all these classes on building relationships. And I said, I've tried all of those things. I got, I can only be myself, you know, I, I can only be myself. And and I, and I hope people are acceptable, are accepting of me for me just being me, um, you know, because I came in, in with the mindset of I have to wear a blue suit, white suit, straight hair. Because <laughs> that was the- what society actually looked at. Like we, we saw certain people on TV and just like you said, the straight hair, the suits, we just knew that there were some business person out there successful. Absolutely. And, and in my mind, it was, you know, you work out twice a day, you, you know, if you can't definitely in the morning, when you wake up, you have a regimen. And again, even though I rebelled sometimes against the military mindset, it's ingrained in me because my, my parents are in the military. So even though when I say rebelled, I mean, like, I need to get up at 630. So I get up at six. <laughs> Let me be clear on the rebellion. I didn't make my bed today. I didn't make my bed today. <laughs> And, and then, you know, I get this reminder, um, I don't know if you know about the Navy, uh, I think it's one of, one of the military officers has a book about making your bed. And that's a big thing in my, you know, my family, like <laughs> rules, you yeah. know? So I was, I don't know. And I, you know, so looking at those things and saying, all I can do is be myself, but apply those principles with what I'm learning and figure out what's the best way to do that. Um, so also doing those things and then where I felt like there was a gap, literally taking classes or finding someone to help me get to the next level. And, you know, definitely GovCon Giants has been amazing with that. So when there are questions, I can go to Eric's, you know, YouTube and say, hmm, let me ask this. I can also go back and look at other references, go to the FAR, I live by the FAR and the DFAR and the CFR. You're, you like reading contracts, you understand them. Honestly, the first year, that's all I did. When, while I was, you know, taking mm -hmm. the training, that's all I did. And I encourage people, it helps because I found, you know, there were times that I was able to say, with all due respect, I don't think that's appropriate. <laughs> You know, I don't, not to be rude, but I say, let's not do that. And, and then sometimes you just don't know, and we all help each other. And, and I think that has been helpful for me because I've, I've learned how to say no to the customer without saying no to, and that's oh. really good. That's been mm -hmm. really good. When you started your business, what was your first thoughts of like, I just quit my job and I'm starting my own business now. So I'll tell you, it felt like. I was going through the motions. I think it was really a weird moment. Again, my niece was being born. I felt like everything was moving and I, I wasn't, you know how you're like, you're not sure. And I was teetering on it. I had conversations about it. People knew. 
And so through that process, the day I, you know, I quit, like I said, about when the day I quit, a, like a few hours later, my niece was born. And so I said, okay, I guess this is my new beginning. Um, <laughs> I'm a new auntie, that type of attitude. But I do remember the first day I said, oh my God, I don't go to work today. I work for myself. And I literally said, okay, after a five minute panic, what should I do was the first thing I, I did. And then the first step after that was um, I, I went through, you know, hey, let me meditate. Let me look and see what I need to do because I can do this. I can believe in myself. I've betted on everyone else. I've helped everyone else. I, I can do this. I started writing down a list of all of the things that I need to do. So literally starting from the ground up as if it was a true startup of all the action items that I needed to do. Also my three, five and 10 year plan. I did all of those the first week and strategies on what I needed to do to be successful. And for the first six months, I didn't see anyone for a while. I read day in and day out. And I said, I'm going to learn how to do this. And I'm going to invest in myself to get this right. It's a sink or swim. And it, again, it just felt, um, the, I, I'm trying to find the right word because I don't know, you know how you, you're at peace and you're saying, I'm right, I'm, I'm right where I need to be, but I'm still scared, but at the oh, yes. I'm not afraid like I would have before I quit. So I had this fear when I quit, like, oh my God, what am it's going to happen? The world's going to come to an end. And then when it happened, it was like, I'm afraid, but I'm okay today. And yeah. Said, mm, and, yeah. The, and I recently had that. And it's funny. It's actually when I told Eric, I was going to leave GovCon Giants. <laughs> You were all devastated. <laughs> I, I, I sat in my car and I, I, was like, I took a breath and I told him. And right after I hung up, I was like, I was crying. But I'm like, I'm going to be okay. I'm yeah. going to be okay. I've done this before. I'm going to be okay. Like I had that. So the day I quit GovCon Giants, I just cried. I told myself I was going to be okay. It's like it felt liberating. It was scary, liberating. Like it was, it's just like it's a. I haven't felt that in a long time. And that day I felt the same thing. Like I'm going to do this and I, I'm proud that I did it. And it's just so many emotions, but yes. it's like, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. Yes. It, and I, I'm appreciative that you said that because when I say it still to this day, I feel like, oh my God, am I the only one? And I didn't know other people feel this way all the time, but it's like a weird feeling because when you say it, it feels so real. So every time I say it, I'm like, not, it's, it's, it's like, it, I'm trying to express the words, but it's almost like you're closing a chapter in your life and starting a new chapter mm -hmm. and you feel it as it happens. Yes. I'm trying to describe it for other people if they haven't felt it. And I've only felt it maybe two or three times and, and it was surreal. And so that time I felt like I was closing a chapter that I'm probably, you know, God willing, will never go back to. And I was going into a new chapter that I, you know, I wanted to do. I wanted to experience. Um, and I can tell you a funny story about that. I actually did, you know, you do the vision boards with your friend every, <laughs> every year. I put it on my vision board two years before I started, maybe. Yeah, almost two years before I started and didn't realize I put it on my vision board. I'm not here to tell people they got to do vision boards because that doesn't always exist. Like you could do the vision board, but it doesn't mean everything will come to fruition. Yeah. But I, but I, I just remember people speaking life into me and giving me the confidence because I had, I was always everyone else's cheerleader and I literally did not have confidence in myself. And so the, that's the only way I can describe it because I know I did things to myself. And what I mean by things to myself was I knew that in the beginning, there were some days I was questioning myself and I literally said, I'm going to give myself an hour because I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, you know? And then I'd have to go back and say, no, do the work, Nicole. Like you can do this. If you were a business owner every day when you went to work for someone else, what did they, you do to grow their business? So start growing your business. And even if you don't have work, start working on, writing out what you will do when you do have the resources or you are available. So it's already planned out. Write out your systems, your back office things that you do. Create your internal database. Even if you don't have work, as you're looking for work, 
create a schedule of exactly what days you're going to reach out to your customers. You're going to reach out to your potential customers. Study your potential customers. That's the biggest thing. Studying your customers, studying the organization, getting to know about the people actually as people and as a customer. It helps. It, it, it helped me. That was the only way I was able to to get to that. And, and my first year was not an easy road. Like I said, I didn't have a loan. You know, I had to go get a business, not a business loan, but a professional, a personal business loan. Mm -hmm. Exactly professional because it wasn't a family member that I got the loan from. It was someone that believed in me and she was willing to give me a business loan. And I, you know, know her professionally. And I was, I cried. I cried because I, I never in a million years thought that people believed in me wow. to do that. And so my whole idea was to pay it forward just to that's help others. And if I, awesome. it, I share it, you know? No, yeah. that's not norm, but why not? It wasn't going to hurt me, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. That's really good. Now I lost where I was going with it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. No, this is good. I love that because I think the reason we started doing this podcast other than the GovCon Giants is because we want people to see our stories. We want to, people to see that it's not like we jumped into this program and poof, we got a contract. We want people to know the reality of it. Like, look, the first six months, people hardly saw you. The first year for you, it was just, you read it, you read into it, you studied it, you researched, you got everything prepared like your organizational charts your back office what am I going to do like your schedule and things like that and that's going to set the system into motion of when you start having the clients they're just going to go into each location into each place and everything's just going to go so people need to hear like a lot of us are, do stay up studying a lot of us do stay up after hours before hours find here and there writing proposals understanding things and that's what people need to hear because you have to hear the reality of the journey it's not a struggle it's a journey and <laughs> when you're going through it you're like like you say you question yourself so much like what am I doing and like is this really but then hindsight after you get a contract or after you you create your business or do something you're like huh it wasn't that bad <laughs> well I'll tell you I actually was kind of the opposite I even questioned myself even more when I got my first contract and I because I I had I I think I was a little different I was like am I supposed to be here um mm. I, I started saying yes I did the work no one gave it to me but am do I deserve to be in here with all of these giants? And how, I have friends that have PhDs and doctoral <laughs> degrees. And I'm saying, how did I get here? I'm just a lowly old country girl. Like where I grew up, we actually had ditches and a sidewalk that just had light, you know? And so, although I love the big city life and my friends, if they ever saw this, they wouldn't even know I was from yeah. the city guys. You know, I, I just kept saying, wow, I'm thankful that I'm here, but, but, I know I deserve it, but I had to talk myself into it. And so to the point where I literally had to do personal development work. And like someone said, so someone called it what it is. Um, I, went, I went to a program and they said, you know, when you have moments and you get discouraged, start writing a, a list about things that you have accomplished mm -hmm. and act as if it's someone you didn't know and then read them and you'll start to build your confidence. I had oh, to go back to that. Wow. And, and I, the reason why I say I felt different was because all, because the work, once you get the contract, please note, the work does not stop. It actually just starts. Yes. I mean, that's why I felt like, holy crap, this is not, this is a different ball game. And I was very shy about telling, you know, some of my former colleagues that I started my business, some knew because I, I personally told them or they saw on LinkedIn or something like that. And I was like, yes, if they asked, but I did not go out and say, good morning, everyone. I started my business. We're open. You know, it was not that type of um, environment. And as you can see, I'm more of a colorful type of person. When I took the, the Myers-Briggs test, mm -hmm. I was like out of Booz Allen, I was like 3%. And I was like, how did I get here? <laughs> 
So I always internalize that saying, I know I'm the purple cow. If you've read that book, I, I, I've become the purple cow and I had to become okay with becoming that purple cow. And, it, and it's a really good book because I said, what, what's unique about me? Me, I'm quirky. I am professional, but I also, I'm, I'm, I am who I am. You know, I'm not, I'm not as polished as the next person that maybe I went to Wharton. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I trust me. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so those were the things that for me, I, I said, you know, I'm smart at what I'm good at and I'm, and what I'm not good at, I try. And I do a really good job at being the best person I can be. But once the contract started, it was go time. The earlier time, it was play time. You know, it was manifesting or writing out what the business would look like because I didn't have days to focus on working on the business. I had to work on keep getting the contract, keeping the contract and sustaining the customer relationship and doing the work and finding new contracts. And so, you know, going back to saying, I didn't see my friends. I'm sure I probably lost friends during the time. And it was with love. I just couldn't do brunch. You know, I wish I had because COVID's here now. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, you pick up where you left off. But I really made that sound decision that it was go hard or go home. And once I gave it my all and I said, even if it doesn't work out, if, can I look at myself in the mirror and say, did I give it everything I got? Mm. And I, and I was like, I'm going to try it. So. So when did you feel comfortable in learning and everything else that, okay, now I'm going to put this into practice and I'm going to try. Uh, it was phases. Um, and I would say I build up real confidence once I started working on the contract. And then after I got my second and third and I helped win. Help but how did things. you get the confidence to get the first one? What made you look at this contract and be like, you know what, I'm going to go for it. So what made me build the confidence was saying, you know what, why not try? That was, that was my first initial. So how I am as a person, I was, I don't know if people are like this. I will start something without thinking about it. Say It looks good. I weighed like in nanosecond, I weigh the options and say, can I do this? Am I aligned? Can I find the right team? Am I able to do this? Do I feel confident enough to communicate effectively and write to the contract? And all of those were, yes, I did the bid, no bid list that mm -hmm. we had. It's an old school Excel spreadsheet that I had. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. After my fifth, yes, I was like, it's go time for me. And then it wasn't until I midway and I, I kept writing the contract. I was like, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait let's think about this. <laughs> wait, 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 this is real. So I'm that person that I'm like, yes, go, go, go. And then in the middle, I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I meant it, I did it. Either. So that's. <laughs> Where did you find the contract? So through um, various agencies and go, also, I would say I went to various agencies and I would just follow the model that Eric said, mm -hmm. you know, picking up the phone, talking to people following up with other con, uh, contract contacts that I had in other mm -hmm. agencies and just saying, hey, I'm letting you know, I'm interested. If there are opportunities out there, please let me know. And I found um, a list of future opportunities and I, the contract that I won, it was on the list. It was, I mean, it was like textbook. Yeah, that's, I was like, it's exactly what we teach. Like, go find the agency that buys your products or services, get the forecast list, call someone and tell them you're interested in this particular project and yes. boom. And I took it a step further. I, before winning the contract, I would research everything about the agency and that department if it was open mm -hmm. to the public. So when it came down to, looking to see what is the organization going? What does that look like? I wanted to have a clear picture. So if I was if ever able to sit down with the customer, you know, cause you never know, they may say, Hey, can you meet the next following, following day? I wanted to be educated enough to say, I understood the organization's pain points. And I also understood what the, what the contract looks like if it was to come out. And so I asked a lot of questions and I, I just, followed everything that Eric said, you know, and I went back, let, let me also say, I went back and I still go back 
to all of the YouTube, you know, things. And I'm all, I mean, I talk in the class, but I'm always like listening or referencing and taking notes and going to find the answer. And so I have notebooks all around. And that's kind of what I did oh. to go after the contract. I could actually say, no, the organization wrote out in, you know, on their site, they're going in this direction. And then if there was a memorandum, I literally would read the memorandum. People are like, you read that? Yes, I read it. <laughs> <laughs> and I followed up and Congress is doing this or this is going to happen. And so by that time, I just kind of OCD on the situation where, and what I mean by that is I wanted to know everything I could. So if a question came up about the opportunity, I was able to reset myself and position myself if a customer asked me questions or if I wanted to ask questions. So I just said, go in and say, hi, my name is Nicole and I'm with GCP and we're a woman-owned business because Eric always says, no one cares if you're woman-owned business. It's, are you able to understand the work? And so I took that to, to push a pride. I really took that seriously when he said that. And I said, well, you know what? They may outsmart me, but at least I'm going to study. <laughs> they can't say, I don't know the nature of the work or I'm not able to identify that. So anytime I look for any opportunities, I start looking at the big picture of where the organization is trying to go and the mission and then also the project. So I have the same process. So let's go through the process. You saw it from the list. You called the small business specialist or the contracting office, whoever the POC was for that one. And how did they go into giving you the contract or giving you the scope of work? So I'll say they didn't give me anything. <laughs> Let me say that. <laughs> they didn't give me anything. I did work for it, but I did make a few calls and I spoke with the POC mm -hmm. and when I reached out to the POC, I introduced myself. I had already kind of had like a mini script and I didn't want to like be all salesy because I was told I sound like a salesperson sometimes. So I was saying hello and kind of the situation, they just picked up, she picked up the phone and I think it was by accident. <laughs> I do. And it had been about 15 times I had called again, going back to my schedule. I had a general schedule and with my general schedule, I would say, these are the days and the hours I would do it. And um, I have like, uh, with my schedule, it's kind of like go time and be time. Productivity is like a big mm -hmm. thing for me on systems. That's kind of how I live my life. And so I was like, this is my window. I'm going to do it. And so I was actually multitasking and she answered the phone and I, you know, kind of had my spiel, but I didn't have it right. And so I kind of <laughs> did what I normally do. Hi, I'm Nicole. And, uh, you know, I said, I'm really, you know, interested in an opportunity. I have other questions. If uh, I have other questions come out, am I able to submit my questions? Please let me know your process. I know all offices are different. I'd love to, you know, send my capability statement. And so I just did the whole thing. And, you know, I think I impressed her, um, but I was very honest <laughs> and probably too honest. And I said, full disclosure, I'm a new business, but I'm really looking to find out what, it, what the organization needs. And if this opportunity is not the right opportunity for me, I'd like to figure out and build a relationship to align myself to understand what you guys need. And, and so I think that was a different approach. Yeah. That's not normal. <laughs> People will say, if it's not, this one's not for me, I'd like to figure out what may be for me and what the organization's looking for if they're moving in a different direction based on the research I have. And I think that was, I, I, either she thought I was crazy or she liked it, one or the other. And so I was able to submit my questions and I was able to put a team together. And so um, it was with an ANC and, and with another partner. And so through that, I said, you know what? I honestly don't know what I don't know, but I know this is, this is big and I want to get it right. And, uh, and, and so we put our heads together and we put our team together and literally I had notes I, I think I scared the rest of the team off. I'm like, this is all I researched. So even when it came down to different um, topics and, and things of that nature, I'm like, I, I, I know this is coming up and this may be interesting. I found out about this and I'm like, take out what you will, but I think this is a great opportunity that we all are aligned to. And so we won. <laughs> How long after you started did you win your first contract? It had been a year, almost a year and a half. Okay. About and how, how long from the time that she picked up the phone and you guys turn in the proposal to when you won it? About eight to nine months. Oh, okay. 
Yes. So and that's the reality of it, though. Like, I, I, I'm still surprised, but that's the reality of it. We, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a process. Everyone has, to, like you said, you guys had to have the time to put it all together. They have to have the time for certain things. So, and where was it? Is it in the state that you live in? Yes. So it was in, in this area. And I will say that the opportunity was very peculiar because what was unique about it it, uh, the organization was changing. Mm -hmm. So when I say that the questions that were asked, there were a list of questions that people were asking and, um, how this situation happened primarily was because I kept in, I stayed engaged anytime there was like a all hands, I was there. Anytime there was something there, I just, I, I, I acted as if I already had the contract. I almost, I pretty much did. And when I say I act as if, I studied everything that came out, even to Google searches. I put a notification if it was related to the topic so I could become well-versed in it and, wow. and know what the competition was doing outside of the organization as well. So for me, it was, I wanted to understand what was, what does that look like now and what was the 2B state and where was the pain point for the agency? So that was my focus and may not have been the right direction for all contracts, but I really wanted to understand what that what that meant for the organization because I knew the organization was evolving. Oh wow. And after you won the contract, and I say it, you said it earlier, it's like this is where the work begins. Oh yes. So once you guys won the contract, how did you, what was that process for you like? So what I felt like I knew well was the hiring process, right? And so I kind of came in like, oh, I know hiring, you know, I know what that looks like. I've been through this process before. <laughs> Take all the stuff you learn in, 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 you know, on paper, throw it out the window. In theory, it sounds great, but in execution, it's different, right? And so going back to what I was saying, I had, I had my HR processes written out, what that looked like how the team would work together or my thoughts as what I, you know, what I would control and what I could be responsible for. Well, in execution, we had to hire the people <laughs> or we had to, you know, turn the people over from the previous contract to mm -hmm. the newer contract. Um, my very first one, we had to hire all new people. So it was a brand new contract. Oh. So that was not fun. And they had specialties. And so um, that was unique. And so before then, what I started doing was going out, building relationships with people that may be looking for a job. So I had a whole database of people with resumes that I knew, but it was all in different areas. And I started, you know, going months before, like I said, preparing as if I already had it and saying, if I was to get this, how could I hire? I was happy and fortunate enough that some of those people accepted opportunities. But when it came down to what the customer wanted, we needed to follow what the customer wanted. Yes. And, and, and what I mean by that is, I'm thinking, oh, we can just hire them and then that's it. No, no, no. There are extra steps on the government side <laughs> that needed to happen and they needed to be tracked. And by the time you look at the step, I was familiar with some agencies that had 42 steps. This kind of turned into 108 steps. So because they were new people. And so tracking that and making sure you had your you met your fulfillment rate. And so communicating effectively why things were not going well. And that, where, that was where I had to go back and say about the personal development, like, no, we are doing these things right. And in theory, that people would be hired, but in execution, life happens. And you have to look at those variables of hiring people. And although they may want to start on Monday, the government may say, hold on, you can't start till next Tuesday, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and you have to be okay with those things. And it's not personal um, and it's not malicious or any of those things. And, and I was okay with that. And I knew that was the case. It's just, we all want things to go our way and you want to be a rock star. And so though that was where I, I had like, why can't they just hit it's, it's there. <laughs> um, how many people did you have to stuff for your first contract? So it was a, to it was a, so I think it, on the first one, because it was a fairly large one, it was about 37 people. And, and those were all new people, all new people for that, that portion. And, um, I, I just, I I've had the mentality, all hands on deck philosophy. And we all did. We all, okay. did. and, um, and as we looked at it, it was okay. Where can we recruit? And I literally was like, 
I did. I just didn't want to be the last man standing, if that makes sense. I, I wanted to contribute. I wanted mm-hmm. to do my part. And I also wanted to understand. So I, I was like, I got these resumes. I've already called. They're interested. I just don't know what the process is. So even during the interview process, I'm like, thank you so much. This is what I, I my understanding that you will be doing. I can't tell you a start date. Here's a tentative start. And they were accepting of that. Yeah. That model worked for me before in another contract when I worked for someone else. And I built the team and actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you took something you did before and now you're doing it for yourself. Absolutely. And two of the people that I hired are now the PMs for that contract. So I knew the model worked. Just that contract me. is still going? Your first contract is still ongoing? Not the contract I worked as a PM on before oh. I left to start my own. That model of hiring everyone before I did the same process. that I used, took the same model even down to the interview script. <laughs> Nothing changed. You're like, let me take out my notes. <laughs> literally, literally. You know, I, I remember I met one custom, one um, applicant at the coffee shop and I said, I know this is not orthodox. However, you know, understand that this is, this is a new opportunity, da, da, da. And, and they were okay. And, and they knew it was real and, and those things. And that's not normal. Um, but she, hey, she had a lunch break. So you got to get creative. And oh, um, okay. So, you know, I know those are not typical things that happen, um, but they're real. They're real when, you know, you're, I'm saying, Hey, I know you're a great candidate for this opportunity. And I know you have the skill set. And, you know, you said you're looking to work in this industry. Here is an opportunity that I think would be great for you. And so I, you know, typically you don't meet someone at a coffee shop to interview them, not for a government <laughs> opportunity. Yeah. And I'll be like, uh, what are you exactly. real? Exactly. And and that happened before. And I said, that is so unorthodox. And if someone heard that, they would say, Are are you crazy? But it worked out. And and I was like, man, maybe I must be doing something different. <laughs> and either, you know, they would different is good. It's working. And so I'm from the school of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know. And if, and if it needs tweaking, it's okay to tweak. And, you know, I literally always say, listen, I'm human. I, I make mistakes, but I want to make sure I do it right first. I want to make sure I understand. Um, and so when I, even through that process, I, you know, said, Hey, is this the right way to do it? And I would check it and Mm. follow up. So we were able to meet our, our rate and they were gracious enough to work with us. And, um, and the project was a great project. And so I was really excited. About How long was that project for? So it was for about two years. Um, and it was a kind of like a pilot program. And they took most of those positions and turned them over to federal positions. Oh, wow. That's I good. Yeah. yeah. Your first, first of all, your first contract was for two years. Just the thought of the, the fact that that was your first personal win. It wasn't like a two weeks in and out job. It's like you had to maintain this payroll, this staffing, everything. Because if someone quits, you have to replace them. It's not like you're just like, okay, cross it off the list. Yeah, it was never ending. And that contract was never ending. But I I learned so much about that area, you know, that industry and what they were looking for and the customer. And, um, And also I built relationships with the staff where sometimes they didn't even know I was the boss. <laughs> and, and when I say building the relationships, just humanizing and saying, yes. hey, how are things? Where can we focus on doing better? Collectively, what would you, you know, what do you need or what would you like to see? And, you know, so even some of my Aww. employees that are no longer employees, I still, you know, just say, are you okay? How are things? And vice versa. So yeah. I think that's what we need more, most in the world right now. It's just like, go to a place that you work that people actually care. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's important. It feels good. Um, And that's why I don't like the mask because it's like, you can't, a smile can make somebody's a difference in somebody's day. And the fact that you can't share that right now, it's just like, (sighs) I know. (laughs) So I know it's off topic, but. (laughs) No, no, no. I, I, I'm with you. I actually went to an event for the first time amongst people uh, Mm -hmm. last weekend and, I hugged everybody. I'm like, it feels good to like hug someone that's not an immediate family member. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I know that sounds weird. I know. Yes. Sweet occasion. And 
it's good to see people. Yes, it's good to see people in, in happy times and uh, and forget like how we were a year ago that we we're all so scared to even like go anywhere near anybody else. Oh my God, it was so, so TMI, but my the weekend that the president shut everything down was my birthday weekend. So I'll never forget it. <laughs> I'm like trying to like say it because I'm like, I was so devastated. And I spent the entire day looking for toilet paper. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'll never forget it. Oh. Yeah. Please tell me, that was not your 40th, was it? No. Oh, okay. I was, okay. But was definitely, like, I have this whole thing. I mean, off topic, but I really want to have a soul train party. And so, like, I never have it on my fourth, like, the year you're going into. I've always had my birthday at the end of that year. Oh. So, Okay. It was really sad because I was like, oh, it's my 39th birthday. I was going to have my it was soul train party. We had to do the line. <laughs> yes, that was going to be the whole thing. And I wanted like all my friends and family just to like dress up. Oh my. Dress up in any era from soul train. Even if you want to dress from American bandstand, I don't care. And just, <laughs> I wanted that. And my, my sister thought I was crazy. Cause I'm like, I even want cereal as a part of the centerpiece. Cause as a kid, I would eat cereal, and watch soul train. <laughs> They're like, you really, you know, have gotten this all thought out. You like, planned it out. I just want everyone to have a good time. I said, I'm a giver. So for me, that would have been a wonderful time to resonate of when I was a kid watching Soul Train and like having everybody's favorite cereal. And we just have good music. And the whole idea is you can't come to the party if you don't dance. Like you have to dance, you know? <laughs> so I know that's a little bit more fun and not as like GovCon-ish, but- Did you do it this year or no? No, because of COVID. So I, I may do it. Oh, you said that the, up there, yeah. it's still like a little shut down. Yeah. It's still a little, yeah, it's still a little shut down. So maybe another time, you know, something like another win or something like that, I may do it and just- Oh, there you go. Yeah, celebrate life. Yes, you know? I was going to say celebrate all your wins so far. Your well, first win. I'm big on even if it's my birthday, I don't want to like have like a whole thing of it. Like I want to have the party, but I don't know, like. These do wanted a party, just, just a, a party, general party. Like there's not. You, you don't want to be the center of attention. The reason that people come to this party. Absolutely, I want people to go and dance and say, just "I remember fun. I had I went to this event and I had a great time and I, and there was no judgment." You know, I just dance, even if I can't dance. I, I, I like, I love that. I love when people are having a good just time. Just free. Yeah, but just it, having fun, you know what yeah. I mean? Like just being in a good mood and just, you know, being happy. So yeah, that's my goal. I, 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 it's kind of funny because I've put it out all the time. Like, I'm going to have this soul train party. <laughs> oh, it's so funny because even one of my customers is like, did you have that soul train party? I'm like, no. <laughs> Like, did you? Have my eyes? I don't tell people about that. <laughs> so sorry. It's okay. Oh, that be that's a good theme. I didn't think of that one. Yeah, it's different. You know, it's truly different, and it's it's, it's at all ages. You know what I mean? And like all kids, like who doesn't love music? Music brings everyone together. So I just felt like that would be really, really kind of cool. You know or for people to do that but that's one of my I will say that's how I identify my success level if I'm able to have that party I like it I like yeah. it yeah. yes and and the key I always do like KPIs mentally but my KPI for that or key performance indicator is if everyone actually says they have a really good time regardless of the age yeah yeah okay I know it's different but I'm okay with it <laughs> You have, hey, it's your party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but to be determined right now, you know, I, it's important for everyone to stay safe. And, yes. You know, really, you know, get, get through this, this moment. So we're almost there. I think, I think we're getting closer and closer. Yes. Yes. So, so <laughs> that was good though. Let's go back to now you've won your first contract. When did you start looking for that second one? Um, almost immediately. And I say that because you got to have an on-ramp and I continuously said, okay, 18 months, right? 
And so I always have a rule of thumb if it's a new agency or if there's new opportunities, it could take anywhere between, um, you know, 18 months. Oh, okay. It's my barometer. That, and that doesn't always it's a good one, though. It's yeah. a very good, w- realistic way of seeing it because some people, if they don't see it happen in a month, they're like, oh, it's not working. Exactly. Exactly. And so it didn't happen in 18 months. It actually happened within that, that first year. And, you know, it was an testament to you know, just doing good work with the customer. And, and they, by happened, they were like, Hey, do you have another opportunity or do you, you know, no. Was it the same agency? It was the same agency, different department and all that stuff. Yeah. But, but yes, uh, same, same agency. And, um, it was, I'm not going to say easy, but it felt easier. <laughs> it should. Right. Cause yeah. after the first one, I think we get a sense of a little bit of confidence. Like I did it. Yes. I'm like, okay, I got to do it again. <laughs> Yeah. See if, it, see if it's if it's real, it's gonna happen again. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, I just went back to my notes, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I tweaked what needed to change, and kind of just based on each contract, I did that. Um, even down to like our office manual, our back office manual, like PM guides, all that. I mean, I it was kind of I'm a little type A, B. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you can tell I'm colorful, but I'm kind of a little type A. Yeah, you need the list and the charts and the manuals and things in specific orders and that you're able to know exactly where to go yes. to know what you're looking for. Yes. And and one of the things that was my saving grace was because I everything, most of my stuff is digital. So it wasn't a matter of like creating it from scratch. I used that downtime from before to already have the framework. So it was easier to kind of go back in versus if I didn't have it. And I'm one of those people that's better to have, you know, have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Mm. Um, and so for me, it was like, oh, let me see, you know, what, what I needed to do. So I just, you know, use that as it applied to, to that opportunity. And, um, you know, we just went from there. Awesome. When was your first contract? What year? That was, so the business search 2016. So that was towards the end of 2017. Okay. So 2017, you got your first one, then a, almost a year later, you got the second one. Yeah. So How did? Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, not but almost before the beginning of 2017. So like almost a year out. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's not bad though at all. No. Like you no. were on it. Yeah. I was gun ho. And then like late, almost like I want to say maybe fall, spring, fall is when the other one came about of, of 2017. And it was just kind of on ramp. Um, I do have to say, I was actually working on a project when I started my business. So for transparency, people didn't even know. A lot of people that I didn't know I had a consulting business. They knew of um, my other business because I was focusing on that as well. And when I decided to make GovCon serious, um, I wanted to make sure that I had those things in order. So kind of went back to scheduling that. So outside looking in, people were like, you gave, you got rid of government contracting and you decided to work on this, you know, invention and this project. And I said, yeah, for a little bit, but I, you know, again, just kind of humbly saying, yeah, I'm doing this. And they're like, how are things going? I'm like, great. And then after a while, you know, people are like, wait, so you do this business and that business? I'm like, yeah, but they're completely different. And for me, once I got my second contract, I felt like it was real and I was comfortable enough to tell people that I actually had mm-hmm. a real business. And I'm, what I mean by that is outside people or people like distant cousins at a you know cookout and they're like, how are you doing? What do you do? How's business? And I'm like, yeah, I actually have a legitimate business. <laughs> You know, I I just felt like, you know, my family, they're great people, but they're, you know, hardworking people. So although they believe in you, they're like, like, how's business? Is it a real business or Mm -hmm. a a hobby, you know? And so after the second one, I'm like, nope, this is real. The training wheels are off. This is real. I can talk about it with confidence because I did it the first time and now I'm at the second time. So, yeah. Oh, uh, how many people, do you remember how many people you had to staff for that second one? I don't, it feels like a blur. <laughs> okay, so the second one was the blur. And then how many do you have to date? How many contracts? So right, I can tell you how many I've helped team. So I've had almost 13 that I've helped team. And I have other contracts, like we're in recompetes right now. So 
um, it's been a world win. <laughs> now, everyone asks, ask all of us this, how did COVID affect your business? So COVID definitely affected the business. However, per the PPP, it did not <laughs> affect the business. I actually did better per MRCPA. And so I'm like, how is this possible? <laughs> I tell people I was the busiest when COVID started. Like we were on conference calls and suppliers and this, I had two projects at the Coast Guard. It's like, <sighs> yes. yes, that was my reality compared to everybody else's. So I'm a little bit like, ugh, I feel like in not entitled, but I feel like I didn't feel the COVID because I was so busy. So I did professionally, I did not feel COVID. Personally, I felt it because of my staff, you know, and what they were going through mm -hmm. and being in the medical area oh, and wow. in various areas. So they were throughout any position at, at that point, any, anything that was affiliated with the hospital, you know, overall there may have been like a staff member that I've worked you know that worked on my contract or something like that mm -hmm. so you know whether they're nurses or other people um we had that experience and so that was that was a that that hurt you know because I'm I'm an I empathize with other people and I understand that that's a hard thing and whatever may have happened but um it was the busiest I mean nonstop, you know, I was doing 14, 16 hour days. Yes. Yes. And, um, I, I, like most people adjusting, um, with, with the kids and meetings and, you know, that was, that was a huge thing. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, I will tell you most of our staff, we, you know, we, we literally said, okay, you know, if you have to have the baby sitting on your lap, we're going to figure this out. And so that's sometimes our meetings with, with the kids, <laughs> whoever it was and, and and luckily enough even sometimes the customers were we did not do that with the customers but there were times the customers had the same situation yeah, yeah. because we didn't know how to figure things out having everybody at home at once like wait no I'm on a call <laughs> yeah like, yeah absolutely you couldn't say I'm on a call and you have a head peeking in the <laughs> back <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was that happened a lot, you know, and I think it's a good thing if the kids were involved, um, because I will say, at least for, you know, my little ones and then that were around, they asked questions or they said, what, what, because at one point they're like, what do you do, you know, and I, and I've had people say that, what do you do? And I'm saying, I, I, I just work. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. Depends on what day and time you ask me. <laughs> 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 so it kind of turned into that and they were my little helpers you know where it's like hey shred these papers <laughs> we're gonna get you in the business sure they're, 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 they're like i'm working now yes and 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 she loved it and she was really excited and she took pride in it you know she can't read but that's okay because she said I'm, I'm doing a good job i'm a i'm a helper, <laughs> I'm a I helper. yeah she's like i'm a helper and we gave her stickers and all of that. And so we made it inclusive. My staff were welcoming about it. They I think they liked her more than me. <laughs> she doesn't talk back. She just does what I, she's told. She's like, hi, you know, and it was like, do you need was, help? <laughs> I am so embarrassed. You know, I went to client site one day and I'm like, don't, you know, don't touch anything, be quiet. And she stole the show. And I'm like, oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> So it worked, it worked out, you know, I, like most parents, they probably were afraid or, you know, uh, people that are helping and, and things like that. It, it, they probably were afraid to add kids or, or whatever, but you just kind of had to run with the punches and say, this is the new norm. Yeah. And so, but it was busy, you know? So one thing that I will say I've learned from it is um, prioritizing uh, personal health and, and having set, setting those boundaries. Cause after a while, the days got the days would blend, you know? <clears throat> so how about yeah. for, for you? I mean, I know you say you were busy, but did you have that same situation where you're like, is it today, Wednesday? <laughs> yes, we had that point because there's a few days that we had like 16 hour conference calls. Yeah. Like we all ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. Yeah. And then waking up to do it all over again and all over again. And I worked from home that, so my days were already blended. So having that constant phone call and Zoom calls, it was just like, 
and with the kids like we are doing ppe too like i took them to the warehouse and they actually shrink wrapped the 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 pallets going (laughs) so i'm like let's go i'm like let's go guys i need to take you with me exactly exactly it helps enjoy it yeah, and it's true. Like they got to know a little bit more of what I do because just like you, people ask me, "What do you do?" I was like, oh. "Well, before I was like, okay, so what do I do?" My mom was confused. Oh, she just says I work for the government. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'll take it. Yeah. She, but then little by little, she started asking about like what, how's the project going at the Coast Guard? Did you guys get the floor finished? I was like, oh, so yes. it, it, it gets. Yeah, your family gets to understand it little by little as you go along. So I will tell you, I have like a slogan and take it if you want it, but um, I got com- more comfortable with like telling people what I did, but instead of telling them exactly what I did, I tell them I'm a slashpreneur. And so they're like, what's a slashpreneur? I'm like, I don't know if you've heard, I like to go all techie, techie, but do you know what a multi-potentialite is? They're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, go to TED Talk, type it in, you'll figure it out. So it's a, basically that's someone who's passionate about different things. And then, you know, they have a job, right? And so they're like, okay. So they get this like, like, okay, I'm following, but I'm not following. Mm-hmm. So, well, a slashpreneur is someone who does multiple things, but they get paid for it. Because at one point I couldn't explain to people like on this project, I do this, on this, I do that. And then sometimes I do, you know, hiring, recruiting, HR, mm-hmm. support, <laughs> whatever you want me to do. Um, so I just found that that was really good to say, you know, and then when they would ask me based upon if it was a customer or if it was, this is before COVID, if it was, you know, my family or someone else, I could answer to what made sense to them. And I thought it was, it worked. It, it helped. I knew it was real when my best friend said, you know what? I love you, but I don't know what you do. And people <laughs> ask and I was, I had a glass of wine and I'm like, oh, I'm all take which and I was like, you know what? I'm a slash renewer. And she says, what is that? And I, I had to talk to her in context of what she could understand. Yes. And that helped me a lot. Um, a, a lot, a lot, because I found more people were becoming interested in what I was doing. And, um, in order to help them understand what I was doing, I wanted to make sure it related to what they could understand. So. I thought that was cool just to kind of have that. So I think I found the title for your episode now. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, cool. (laughs) There you go. Slash, because in all context of it, you said I team together 13 contracts. Yeah. Because they're not your, it's not your company's contracts as you help put them together. And like you said, um, depending on what the project is, is what role you pay play you could be the hiring person you could be just hr you could just be project manager you could just have found the opportunity so it's like it just depends on what it is and you go with it and it's good because it's always gonna be something different yes because at one point like one customer was like one of my customers i team with and i call them customers but they're a teaming partner they're like, oh yeah, you help do all of our BD and capture management. And I was like, I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know that, you know? And, and so, you know, the other customer, they're like, oh, you, you know, we love that you help and advise and do it out. And I'm like, okay, great. And then the ones that I actually, you know, manage, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I'm the PM and da, da, da. And they're like, okay, okay. <laughs> you tell us what to do. And I'm like, so it's hard to explain to others that may never worked in contracting better yet government contracting to explain what I do and so if I'm talking to a person that's in the IT side I may say things that are relevant in health IT and if I'm talking to someone who's like more blue collar may have worked in logistics or something like that I'm able Mm. to say these are some of the things I've done and so I've I feel like a chameleon um and I at one point I used to be like oh man this doesn't feel authentic but I found that it resonated with the person I'm speaking with and, in, and then also, if it's a group of people where I've had to speak at events, um, I've, I've done like, I love STEM. So I speak at STEM um, oh. program, programs to younger kids. And so I found the Slashpreneur is the way to go because they're looking at me like deer in head, like, so what is government contracting? Like, it just I sounds found, boring. Yeah, it's like it's fun. So when I say Slashpreneur, they're like, tell me more. That's kind of cool. 
Because they're like, I know it says entrepreneur, but slash, what does that mean? And I'm like, what does a slash mean? Yeah, yeah. That's where I got the lean in moments from, from the kids. And I talked to them about, you know, how you can do government contracting in any field. Like you, they use livestock. Anything that you sell, the government works on. And if you have that specialty, I said, they actually buy toilet paper. I, they do. I said, they buy toilet paper. I said, so if you know a manufacturer, you're able to, to do that. I said, so it's a real business. And so I find that some of the kids are really interested in that just by using that word, because I tried the whole, I'm a government consultant. And the kids were like, can she stop? Like, <laughs> this is But not- I love that you're talking to kids because me growing up, I didn't, I've never heard of, I've, the thought of having my own business never crossed my mind. Like that was for people that made it. Like you had to have everything together in order. So for me doing it, and even when Eric told me, I looked at him like, are you crazy? Like, I don't have anything. He's like, oh no, just go on SunBiz and pay your $125 and that's it. I'm like, it can't be that easy to have a business. Mm -hmm. So so the fact that the younger generations are having that talk that put into their heads, it's going to help them mold them into I don't have to go into certain career paths like there's so much more now that they are able to do yes yes and and I think it's so important because when I grew up I will say I really did want to work in fashion and film and entertainment like I wrote that down in kindergarten I said I wanted to be a lawyer because I did I mean I I still maybe one day in another life like if I'm ever able to retire probably will do it Um, but I feel like you have to like focus all your time to do something like that and so I knew that that was what I wanted. And I, when I became a teenager, I said, okay, let's be real. At, at a teenage age, you thought 40 was old. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, when I'm 40, then I'll start a business, but it'll probably be on the side. I never, so I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur oh. or a business owner, but I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know what that meant. And I always imagined myself like speaking like a proposal type of thing. I didn't even know what that was. And like, so like someone saying yes or no, but I didn't know, know what that meant. You know what I mean? In theory, I just knew I may want to do that, but it'll be a, you know, a part-time business or something I do on the weekends. So when it became real, it was really scary because I had all of these doubts. Like you said, I, I, I wasn't the smartest. I, my, my circle and my friends, they were smart. I felt like they were smarter. I wasn't the richest <laughs> definitely wasn't that you know so I'm like how am I going to be able to do these things and so all of those things that I I felt like I I didn't I didn't have I really had to build up my confidence to say you know what I have everything that I need inside of me or to do this everything that I need and I'm looking for I have the capabilities of doing it and if I and if I don't I need to try to prove to myself so the hardest part was me. I mean, it really was. I'm still doing development work. Not that I've had low self-esteem or anything like that, because that wasn't the case. It was literally saying, I am worthy enough to do this, to start, and I can complete it, and I can keep going. And I know that's probably cliche. I was going to go, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, good. Some people are like, no, oh. no, I get it, because... I'm telling you, you're speaking directly to me, I think. I know the podcast for everybody else, but like you're speaking directly to me when it comes to that because we have to, somebody told me, you have to start talking to yourself more positively, have more confidence in yourself. Everybody around you sees how successful you are. Yeah. So yeah. you just have to now do it for, you have to feel that for yourself. Yes. And, and so I always feel like i Every time I talk to the young kids, I'm talking to that little girl or that boy that people see those things in or when people don't and they say, you know what? I want to try to do that, you know? And I, and I, and I say this because I'm I'm a regular person. I put my pants on like everybody else, right? My mom used to say, you never mistreat people, you know? And so from the janitor to whomever you speak, it doesn't matter where you go. When you walk into a thing, you speak. Even if it's the president and you're nervous, speak, <laughs> you know, <laughs> follow protocol, but speak. So for me, it was like, okay, let me keep that in the back of my mind. But also I remember when I said, I want to do that, but I don't know if I have the, I, I have the goods to do it. And so I'm like, 
every day for me has been like a walk in testimony in this process. I've had some, you know, down times and, um, you know, through the, through that moment, but somehow or another, I'm, I was able to go through it and I was able to do that, you know? So for me, that was a big, that was a big deal. And I'm saying, you know what, I may not be this girl, like this, all that person, but if I can do it, I know you can do it. All you have to do is try and say, make the commitment. I'm going to do it. And I said, I know it's probably not the most inspirational. I'm not giving you like all the like rah, rah, inspirational things, but I'm like, it is real. Like, if you want to do it, just say, you know what, stop looking, don't look at any of the negativity or don't look at anything outside of that focus on your goals. And even if you don't have whatever you're lacking, prepare as if it happens All right, as if it's already happening. And when it happens, you'll, you'll be like shocked. And so that's all I did. I just followed that model. I still, to this day, follow that model and say, you know what, if I don't, I don't have this part right, or if I make a mistake, you know, in the process, I don't know what I don't know. I'm still going through, I'm still learning. Um, that, though, that's the part where I'm like, as we speak, giving myself grace about things that I don't know and saying, don't beat myself up. What is the lesson learned that I can learn from this? Um, and, and going through that, like literally writing it out. So when people are like, how do you do that? Like I'm writing it out and saying, you know what, this I don't like, but what could I have learned from it or what can I do better? That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's what a lot of people need to hear. Honestly, like that is what people have it in them. They just need to hear it from you, from me, from the other person that this is possible. Mm -hmm. that, and it just takes a little bit more self digging to put things into motion. Yes. And, and block out anything that says it's not possible. Cause, of, cause of, <laughs> so I'm, I, I was raised by my aunt and older people. So I like these old little like cliches, but he to say, and, and, and also as a part of this process, and I usually don't bring this up to give you an understanding of how hard this was. I, my mom and my aunt have Alzheimer's. So that was my, one of those moments where I'm like, is this right? What I need, what do I need to do? And so it was so important and pivotal when I say, um, to give you an idea of why I say the chapters were closing in my life and opening in, in my life, because to me at one point, my entire personal construct of how I was raised, um, and what I mean by that is all the people who were matriarchs mm -hmm. in my family, they were transitioning. And so it was really difficult for me to learn and not go back to them and say, what do you think? Oh, not go back to them and say, you know, what, what are your thoughts? or like, I want to run this by you, um, where I had to like dig deep and run it by myself and say, what would they have said? You know, oh, just wow. know, where you can't pick up the phone and call your mom and say, you know what? I have left it. So I, I know that's, no. that's trying to be a little authentic. So people, you know, no, yeah. that's one of the things I work on and that was my biggest thing to say, you know, not to get too personal, but for you to, for people to understand things are going to happen. And I said, this is the one thing that really could have crushed me, not one, but two people that I love dearly that were my mentors that I looked up to um, in both ways and who did amazing things and who said, you know what? Impossible actually is. I'm possible without the apostasy. And they used to say that all the time. And I used to say, okay. And I would cry. I'd be like, I'm possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can't do that all the time, but you know, um, but I honestly, before going to a customer and I'm saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do, I would psych myself out. I'm like, I'm possible. I'm going to do this. And, uh, another person who, um, worked in government contracting years ago during a long administration time, interesting enough, he passed a year after the business. So he passed maybe a month after I got my first contract and he was so instrumental in uh, me understanding how it used to be. I love hearing old stories, right? <laughs> oh, so awesome. And um, uh, you always call me his daughter. And it was just so, such a great person. And uh, he also used to work in the music industry. Um, his wife did at one point. And so the cool part about it was he said, you know, kid, when I used to get down out and I would question myself, I'd go in the bathroom. He said, I'd look at myself. And I tell myself a few things that I like to hear. And he said, I'd say, I want bad MF. -er. And I just <laughs> he said, I go out and I do it. 
And so I said, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna look at myself in the mirror, but I think about that all the time. Like that, that made me smile. And that was like one of those moments where I'm like, okay, if he can do that. And he was like the most confident person I've known him since I was a preteen, you know, from my family. Wow. So he's done so many great things. And so I'm like, if he had confident issues, then dang go, because he was super confident <laughs> to the day he passed away. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all your stories. And like you said, you want to see the real you, the real person that's behind this success. And I know you said Soul Train Party's coming when you feel that you've reached success, but 13 contracts? Like, what more is it going to take for you to reach that sense of like, Huh, I did it. I'm successful. So I it's kind of cliche, but I feel like success is when you are able to in, inspire and help others and it's okay. always evolving. So short answer, I do have like my I do have my KPIs and I do have my goals <laughs> for <laughs> so when I meet those personally. Okay. But, but honestly, if, if I am able to inspire and help someone else, I feel like that's my term of success. And if I'm able to grow the business and it's a, you know, a great business um, that, you know, cares about their staff, care about their employees, and also care about the customer, do work, do good work and build that brand and reputation. I, I honestly feel like that's a good form of success because a lot of times people, in various communities may not have opportunities for jobs or op are different places and, um, or they may want to learn. Um, now, obviously you have to be qualified, but sometimes, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit more um, because the, it, various industries are different. And so if you're able to um, help students or help people that are looking to do those things and provide a skill set or provide safe haven to at least give them a stepping stone, I think that's my purpose in life right now. That's what I feel like. And so through those opportunities and making sure that they're able to, then that's my term of success. And I want to say, say the story because what was pivotal, I had a cousin who came to live with me. She had a master's degree. She actually worked at one of the companies, I won't say. And um, she did everything right when it came to school. And so she got her master's in IT. She got her undergrad in IT. She graduated with a 4.0. And she found out she needed to have her certifications um, for a particular job. And so what I find that's so inspiring and why I am so adamant about saying, providing that conduit and sharing that information, unfortunately, she wasn't unable to keep the job because she did not have the right certifications. But the schools she went to, they always talked about having those degrees. And so I think it's important for businesses like us to communicate back to the communities of all, all backgrounds and everything to say, hey, yes, get an education, but it's important in these industries. These are the things that you need mm -hmm. in order to get that job. And so it was really difficult and very hurtful to see that she was not able to stay and stay in that position because she did everything right and she needed to take the test and she had test anxiety, you know? So, so for me, that, that became a really, a really big driving force. Um, I'm happy to say she did get, finally get her certification, and everything, <laughs> but you know, it was a pivotal moment, you know, because she was living in my house. <laughs> yeah. You have all these degrees that what you're supposed to do that society tells us, if you have this, this, and this, you're successful, you've made it. And then you're like, out in the real world and they're like oh you need to just take a test I'm like yes 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 so. so that that happened a lot and so I found myself going to schools and telling just even sharing other companies like just so you know this memorandum says you need this you know? <laughs> yeah I actually uh, full disclosure there was a uh, a stem program and I sat and uh, I did spoke with them because um, they were, you know, working on a STEAM project. And I said, sir, you know, I want to speak to you about your STEM, um, STEM program. You know, if you have a lot of people going into hot, um, IT or, you know, they want to go into different agencies, there are companies out here looking to hire people just in general that have those requirements. And one, one gap that we're finding is they don't have the right certifications. So that is important. It's so important. And so just sitting down and talking with him about his, his STEM program and how 
that was, you know, he came back, you know, a few months later and said, you know, I got a couple of college students. They said they didn't want to go to college. So they're going to community college, but they got their certification and they got a job. That's awesome. That's great. You know, you're, you're helping change the world. Uh, one person at a time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you have to run, but I wanted to thank you so much for sharing, for your words, your motivation. And I know that this podcast is going to really inspire a lot, a lot of people out there. Some of them, we're not going to hear from them, but just know that you have. Oh, so, awesome. Starting with this one. So. <laughs> well, I want to say I... I'm so appreciative of you, Maria. I mean, literally I came in, I didn't know nothing. I'm like emailing you. I'm like, I know I've never met her and didn't call. So it is so great to finally meet you and speak (laughs) with you. We talk all the time on email Mm -hmm. and um, you will be missed. So thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day. All right. You do. Stay safe out there. (laughs) We'll do. (laughs) Bye. Bye.